The Muslim world in particular claims that Palestine belongs to them and that Israel has stolen it um, from them. It has also been claimed, even in a United Nations Assembly, that Israel has no historical connection with the mount where the mosques sit. However, there is overwhelming archaeological evidence which confirms Israel's historical right to the land and to the mount where the mosques sit, and that evidence is going to be presented in this program tonight. Abraham, the progenitor of Israel, was called by God to leave his hometown of Ur to go to inherit Canaan around 2000 BC. Genesis chapter 21 says Abraham dug a well in the land at Beersheba. This one that you're looking at on the screen dates back to Abraham's time and is believed to be the very one that his servants dug. Genesis chapter 23 says Abraham purchased a field and cave in Hebron for a burial site. He and his son Isaac, not Ishmael notice, Isaac and Jacob, along with their wives, six people altogether, were buried there. Abraham's purchase of the cave and field is actually confirmed by this relief of Pharaoh Shishak of Egypt. 1,000 years after Abraham, Shishak invaded Israel, conquered many towns and localities. The name of each one is inscribed on this relief, and one of them is called the Field of Abraham. There's definitely a cave there, and in this picture we're on the inside of it looking out. The Muslims themselves have confirmed this biblical history by building this mosque over the cave as a memorial of the death of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their wives. Moreover, they've set up six cenotaphs, that is symbolic tombs, inside the mosque as a memorial of Israel's six patriarchs, but not a cenotaph for Ishmael, the Muslims' patriarch. The book of Genesis clearly teaches that God promised the land to Abraham's descendants through Isaac and his son Jacob. And it is recorded that Jacob dug a well at Shechem. You're looking at it here. This well is regarded actually as one of the most authentic sites. It's very, very old. Even the Muslims regard it as Jacob's well and cannot point to any wells anywhere in the whole land that were dug by Ishmael. Joshua led the Israelites, not the Ishmaelites, into the promised land. And Joshua 8 verse 30 says, He built an altar near Shechem on Mount Ebal. During an archaeological survey in 1980, the remains of that altar were found, as you see on the screen here. There are also references in Joshua chapter 24 to Joshua setting up a stone of witness at Shechem. And it is believed that this ancient stone monument seen here on the screen um, is that uh, stone of witness. But much more convincing evidence has been found confirming Israel's original and early occupation of the land. Take, for example, this victory still of Pharaoh Menepta, who reigned around 1200 BC, which gives an account of his victories and includes a victory in Canaan over Israel, saying, quote, Israel is devastated. It was discovered at Thebes in 1896, and it's housed in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It provides proof positive that Israel occupied Canaan by at least the 13th century BC. It is therefore commonly known as the Israel Still. In 1994, this stone slab was found on a mound in northern Israel known as Tel Dan. An inscription was found on the stone which read, quote, The House of David, the King of Israel. It was written in the Hebrew script of the 9th century BC. 
The inscription confirmed that Israel existed in the land and that David was king and had a dynasty, referred to as House. This is around 1000 BC. Pharaoh Shishak's victory relief, seen earlier, is on a temple wall at Thebes and also confirms Israel occupation of Canaan. He reigned from 945 to 920 BC, and his relief records how he invaded Israel, plundered treasure from the temple at Jerusalem, and took captives from cities in Israel. The temple he referred to, which he plundered, was the one built by Solomon on the Temple Mount where Muslim mosques sit today, proving that Israel's temple was there long before the mosques. This is a drawing of Shishak's relief. It depicts 10 lines involving 156 of Israel's towns and localities, which are all named, again confirming Israel's occupation of the land at that time, nearly 1000 BC. In this close-up, you can see the 156 towns and localities depicted as people attached by cords to Pharaoh, and their names are inscribed on their body, which is in the shape of a tablet or cartouche with serrated edges. This black obelisk was commissioned by the ancient Assyrian king Shalmaneser, who reigned from 859 to 824 BC. It was discovered in 1846 in Nimrad, northern Iraq. It's inscribed with many inscriptions and scenes commemorating the victories and deeds of the king. One of the scenes on the obelisk refers to Israel in her land which he invaded and actually mentions by name the king of Israel who was reigning at the time, namely Jehu. Not only that, but this carving on one of the panels depicts Jehu on his knees offering tribute to the king of Assyria. The inscription on the, on the obelisk tells us that it is Jehu. This confirms references in the Bible to both Jehu and Shalmaneser. Jehu is mentioned by name about 60 times in the Bible, and Shalmaneser twice by name and other times as the king of Assyria. This is the Moabite stone, discovered in 1868 at Dibbon in Jordan, which was occupied in biblical times by the Moabites. It's in the Louvre Museum in Paris and is inscribed with a record of the rebellion of Mesha, the king of Moab, against the king of Israel. This is a printout of the inscription. Moab had been in subjection to Omri, king of Israel, but rebelled during the reign of their king Mesha around 840 BC. This piece of history is referred to in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 3. Reference on the stone to the king of Israel by name and Israel's god Yahweh by name confirms again Israel's occupation of the land under a king at that time in 840 BC. This six-sided hexagonal prism was unearthed in 1830 at the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh, situated in Iraq today. It is now in the British Museum. It records the triumphs of the Assyrian king Sennacherib, who reigned around 700 BC. On the prism, he refers to the Jews in the land of Canaan and mentions their king, Hezekiah, by name. This confirms references in the Bible to Sennacherib, who invaded Israel, confirming that Israel occupied the land in 700 BC and was ruled by a king named Hezekiah, who reigned from Jerusalem. According to the Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and Isaiah 9 verse 11, due to the threat of an Assyrian invasion and siege by Sennacherib, Hezekiah commissioned the digging of a tunnel to divert water from the Gihon Spring outside the walls of the city 
to a pool inside the city, indicated by the blue line on this uh, picture. The curving tunnel is 533 metres, that is 1,750 feet long, and ends in the pool of Siloam. It's still there today, and is actually quite a popular tourist attraction. Tourists who are prepared to get their legs or pants wet can walk the full length of the tunnel from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam. Towards the end of the tunnel, an inscription was found in the wall in 1880, describing the digging of the tunnel. Unfortunately, the inscription was hacked out and ended up in a Turkish museum, but Israel has installed a replica in its place. Here's a closer picture of the replica. The sign above it says, quote, You are standing at the place where the Shiloh inscription, written approximately 2,700 years ago during the reign of King Hezekiah, was discovered. This here is actually the original in the Turkish Museum, and it clearly confirms the biblical account of the digging of the tunnel by the Jews who clearly occupied the land at the time 2,700 years ago. A Persian by the name of Cyrus led the victorious armies into Babylon around 539 BC, and an amazing prophecy had been given concerning this in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, mentioning Cyrus by name about 200 years before he was even born. The prophecy in Isaiah also stated that Cyrus would sign a decree to allow the Jewish captives at Babylon to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And the Bible in Ezra chapter 1 refers to Cyrus doing this. This clay cylinder found at Babylon records how Cyrus conquered Babylon and allowed the Jewish exiles return to their homeland to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. Once again, this confirms the occupation of the land by the Jews around 587 BC and the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem on the Temple Mount where the Muslim mosques sit today. Added to this evidence of Israel's occupation of the land in biblical times could be numerous seals, tablets and coins which bear the actual names of biblical characters. This is an artist's impression of the city of Lachish, a city in Israel in biblical times and referred to in the Bible quite a few times. But it was attacked and destroyed by the Babylonians and has been depicted on Babylonian reliefs that were found by the archaeologists. Extensive excavations have taken place there and significant discoveries have been made. The most significant discovery were 18 letters, now known as the Lachish letters. They were found among the ashes and charcoal in the guardroom adjoining the outer gate of the uh, city. <clears throat> These are some replicas of the letters here. Each one was a fragment of a clay pottery vessel known as a potsherd. That's the technical name um, for it. On each of them was a message inscribed in an iron base ink. The letters were written in ancient Hebrew and were from Hoshaiah, commander of a Jewish garrison stationed at an outpost. This Hoshaiah is actually referred to in the Bible in Jeremiah 42 verse 1 and 43 verse 2. His letters were sent to Lachish prior to the city being besieged by the Babylonians, providing information about posts held by Jewish troops. The messages confirm the biblical reference to Hoshaiah that he was a real person, a Jew, living with other Jews in the land of Israel around 600 BC. Another letter refers to Gemariah, Jaazaniah, Jeremiah, Mataniah, Neriah, Elnathan, Ahijah, 
all of whom were living in the land and all of whom are mentioned by name in the Bible. The prophet Jeremiah lived at the same time in the land of Israel and we read that he had a friend by the name of Baruch, son of Neriah, who wrote down messages dictated by Jeremiah. Jeremiah 36 also tells us that the king of the Jews sent his son, Jeremiel, to arrest Baruch. Well, would you believe it? The archaeologists found a seal belonging to Jeremiel. It's on the screen now. It says, quote, to, that is belonging to, Jeremiel, son of the king. <clears throat> but not only was Jeremiel's seal found, but also this seal, which belonged to Baruch, the man who Jeremiel was sent to arrest, that is Jeremiah's scribe and friend. His seal reads, quote, to Baruch Yahu, son of Neriah, the scribe. Another man referred to in Jeremiah chapter 36, who was a friend of Jeremiah and Baruch, was Elishama. He was one of the king's court officials sympathetic towards Jeremiah and Baruch and helped protect them from those who weren't. Well, this seal on the screen now um, was found during excavation bearing his name. Earlier on, I mentioned that one of the names found in the Lachish letters was, was Jaazaniah, commander of the Jewish army. The seal on the screen was found bearing his name. It says, Jaazaniah, servant of the king. After the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, they appointed a Jew by the name of Gedaliah to be governor over the Jews who were to remain in their land. We read this in 2 Kings 25, verse 22. Well, the seal on the screen belonged to him. The Bible says that the wife of Ahab, king of Israel, was Jezebel, who was a Phoenician by birth. You can imagine the surprise, therefore, when this seal bearing her name was found. It's carved in the Phoenician style and incorporating Egyptian elements it has a four-mirror image, Hebrew letters on it, which spell Jezebel. Of particular interest to Bible students is this tomb, due to the inscription found inside it on the lintel. The inscription is superimposed at the top of the, um, of the picture. <clears throat> the inscription tells us the tomb belonged to Shebna, the manager of the royal household. He was a Jew living in Jerusalem at the time that Hezekiah reigned as king over the Jews. Believe it or not, the Bible in Isaiah chapter 22 actually refers to Shebna, a high official, a steward in King Hezekiah's court who was carving out a tomb for himself on the rocky hillside at Jerusalem. The seals and inscriptions found by the archaeologists bring to life in an uncanny way Bible characters who have been dead for several thousand years. And they provide evidence that the Jews occupied the land over a period of 1,500 years during which they had a temple on the mount where the Muslim mosques sit today. As I said earlier, some claim that Israel never had a temple on this mount, and it was even stated at a United Nations meeting that Israel had no historical connection with it. The Bible says Israel's first temple was built by Solomon on this mount around 950 BC. That is about 1,600 years before the Muslim mosques were put there about 1,500 years before Mohammed was even thought of. And, as we saw earlier, Pharaoh Shishak's victory relief confirms this by its reference to plundering treasure from the temple at Jerusalem when he invaded Israel not long after Solomon's death during the reign of his son Rehoboam. 
as we read in 1 Kings 14, verse 25. It has also been pointed out that the Babylonians destroyed that temple in 587 BC and the Jewish captives in Babylon were given permission 70 years later by Cyrus the Persian to return to their land and rebuild the temple. Cyrus' cylinder confirms this and bears testimony to the second Jewish temple at Jerusalem. Then, in 19 BC, Herod pulled the second temple down and built a third one on a grander scale. He also enlarged the temple mount or platform. The enclosure walls around the mount represent the size that he increased it to. This is an artist's impression of Herod's temple viewed from the, uh, from the south. Here's another artist's impression of it viewed from the east. Josephus, the first century historian, saw this uh, temple and gave witness to it. And 10,000 of Herod's masonry still exists in the lower courses of the enclosure walls today. It's the height of ignorance and dishonesty or deception to deny that Israel ever had a temple on this mount. It's really an outright blatant lie, which further archaeological evidence will demonstrate. This is the plan of Herod's enclosure walls. As you can see, it's not rectangular. It's more wedge-shaped. The total distance around it is 5,073 feet. Um, yeah, about 1,556 metres. The total area inside is 14 hectares, about 35 acres. Now, in this plan of the Temple Mount, the three colours represent the three different stages it has been through. The yellow section represents the platform of um, Solomon's Temple. According to the Mishnah, an authoritative collection of Jewish laws, Solomon's platform was 500 royal cubits square. The, uh, the pinky-orangey section represents a 40-metre, that is 132-foot extension to the south of Solomon's platform in 141 BC by the Hasmoneans, that is a dynasty of Jewish rulers instituted by the Maccabees. And the green section represents Herod's extension to the north, south and west. Herod didn't extend the platform to the east due to the Kidron Valley. He uh, retained the line of the original eastern um, wall. Extensive research has taken place to locate Solomon's temple platform and some interesting discoveries have been made. Archaeologist Lean Rittmeyer, seen here examining paving stones on the temple mount, has been a key player in the investigation. Although the temple proper has gone and not a stone of the building above the ground can be seen, there are, however, traces of the platform. That is, rows of stones, wall remains, sections of pavement, rock cuttings and cisterns, etc. And all these pieces of evidence are sufficient when combined and put together to locate Solomon's 500 cubit square platform on which he built his temple. The demonstration begins with this flight of steps at the northwest corner of the Temple Mount, which uh, lead up to the Muslim platform where the mosque sits today. There are eight flights of steps like this around the mosque, as you will see in the next picture. <clears throat> The flight that interests us at the moment, which we were looking at before in the northwest corner, is up at the top left corner um, of this uh, picture. <clears throat> Where is it? Up, up the top here. <clears throat> in this um, closer aerial picture, the same flight of steps are, are, uh, we're talking about here flight here. Mm -mm. 
they're pointed out uh, in that in that corner there of the uh, the diagram. We'll, we'll move closer to them um, in this uh, this picture here. The um, the bottom step of this um, staircase, coloured red, is not exactly parallel to the wall of the Muslim platform where it rises. And because the bottom step usually determines the direction of the flight of steps, the whole flight of these steps is not parallel to the outer wall of the um, platform. However, each of the other seven flights of steps do run parallel with the, um, with the wall. You can see what I'm talking about here is that um, this is the Muslim platform along here, but the, 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 uh, the steps comes, comes along there. It doesn't follow the same line at all. <clears throat> of particular significance is the fact that the 17 metre long bottom step is different, this is long here. <clears throat> it consists of large rectangular blocks of hewn stone, known as ashlars, whereas the other steps are made up of smaller stones. Though the rectangular stones look like the bottom step, they were in fact a wall, part of an ancient wall which is now believed to be part of the western wall of the original temple platform built by Solomon. This conclusion was reached in part by examining this older black and white photo taken of the same steps. When it was taken, the paving that butted into the bottom step was lower, revealing that the stones had margins and bosses by which they could be identified and dated. In case anyone's not sure what margins and bosses are, this drawing explains. The boss is the raised central area which protrudes from the main body of stone. Four different examples are shown here in both head-on and side views. The margin is the narrow area that runs around the outside edge of the boss, seen better in head-on views. The margins and bosses on these Herodian stone blocks can be seen quite clearly. To the untrained eye, building blocks from various periods resemble one another, but the boss and margin is the tip-off to date the block. As pottery and architecture change shape and design and can be dated accordingly, so also can building blocks. They are among the archaeologists' best dating tools. A good example of the variety of blocks can be seen in this picture on the screen of a section of the southeast wall pointing back to the Hasmonean, Herod and Crusader periods. Now, the margins and bosses on the stones in that bottom step we were looking at before were quite different from the masonry used by Herod. It was discovered they were the same as the ground level masonry on the opposite side of the Temple Mount, that is in the eastern wall near the eastern gate, which you're looking at here. Here's a closer view of the gate. The bottom course of stones in the wall date back long before Herod's time. Because the same stones were in the bottom step on the opposite side, it was concluded they dated back to the same period and represented part of the original wall of the early temple period. Significantly enough, the line of the bottom step ran exactly parallel to the um, eastern wall. What I'm saying is that this, the angle of that is exactly parallel with uh, this wall here. It was also noted that the northern end of the stone wall, which formed the step, was exactly in line with the northern edge of the Muslim platform. It was further noted that the line running from the northern edge of the step to the eastern wall passes along a rock scarp, that is a sheared off rock ledge. I'm talking about along here. It's believed that this scarp was originally cut 
to hold the foundations of the northern wall of Solomon's Temple Mount. Significantly enough, the measurement from the western corner to the corner of the eastern wall is equal to 500 cubits. So about from here over to here. Now, in order to complete the 500 cubit square platform, a measurement of 500 cubits was taken down the eastern wall and it came to a slight bend in the wall. We're coming down here now and here is the bend. The bend in here. The bend begins where a column protrudes from the wall. You can actually see the column here in the wall. But you can't see the bend from this particular angle. The bend, of course, is where Solomon's wall ended and was later extended. This is evident from the different masonry in the wall from this point on. The foundation of the southeastern corner of Solomon's wall is probably still there today below ground level. As can be expected, in order to ascertain the southern wall of Solomon's square temple platform, a line was drawn from the bend across to the west. Come across here. <clears throat> 500 cubits, parallel, of course, with the northern wall up here. And when a line was drawn on the western side from the bottom step directly south, from there down to here, <clears throat> it intersected the southern line and also measured 500 cubits. This resulted in a perfect 500 cubit square platform, which could hardly be a coincidence. I now want to go back to the eastern gate area, where we saw that the ground level course of stones in the wall are the same as those in the bottom step on the uh, opposite side. You can see that it, even this, how different these bottom um, stones are here from those uh, ab above them. In this picture, we are alongside that wall, looking along the stones towards the gateway projection. It's natural to wonder if we dug down beneath this lower course of stones, whether or not the small stones continue underneath, and the same stones, shall I say, whether or not they continued underneath, and if they do, how far down do they go? Would they confirm our conclusions? Well, there's an interesting story to tell about that. In April 1969, James Fleming, a student of biblical archaeology at the Tel Aviv University, visited Jerusalem and he went to the Golden Gate, which you see here, to take some photos. As he was kneeling down, the earth gave way under him and he dropped into a hole two and a half metres, about eight feet deep. In the dim light that came through the hole, he could see, as you can see in this picture which he took, that he was standing among the bones of 30 to 40 skeletons. They had apparently been thrown together in a mass burial within the previous hundred years or so. Below the Golden Gate, the ancient temple wall was exposed, as you can see in this uh, picture here. Then he noticed with astonishment that on the wall were wedge-shaped stones neatly set in a large arch, which you can see in this picture. They were the remains of an earlier gate, giving entrance to the Temple Mount, but buried when Herod raised and enlarged the mount. This diagram illustrates the situation. The brown area is below ground level. The tomb into which Fleming uh, fell is uh, indicated there. The double gateway beneath the present gateway is also marked, you'll notice. The wedge-shaped stones at the top of the arch of the gate, which Fleming also saw inside the tomb, are also marked there on the diagram. Notice also that the first course of those ancient stones on ground level, which are, which are um, coloured um, grey, as well as the wall underneath on both sides of the gate, they are named earlier wall here. The reason for this is obvious. 
They are all part of the same wall and date back to the same period as the underground gateway. As this cross-section diagram shows, there are 17 courses of this ancient stone. In view of the fact that there are no other older courses of stone underneath these, it has been concluded they are the oldest, the original, dating back to Solomon's time. These men here are at the Temple Mount enclosure wall, busy sieving every shovel full of dirt in order not to miss the tiniest object of interest. Sometimes the smallest of items can be very significant and act as a basis on which important information can be gained. This thumb-sized ivory pomegranate is believed to have come from Solomon's temple. It's less than five centimetres, that is two inches high. Due to a small hole in its base, into which a thin rod could be inserted, it is thought that the pomegranate was originally mounted on a scepter, possibly on the head of the high priest's scepter. Since the pomegranate was found, several pomegranate scepters such as these have been found, with their rods intact, giving some idea how the ivory one may have been mounted. According to Exodus 28, pomegranates and bills encircled the hem of the Jewish priest's robe. Not ivory ones, though, but uh, embroidered ones. The pomegranate also served as an ornament in Solomon's temple and decorated various parts of the building and its furniture, and such may have been the case with the uh, ivory one. What suggested a connection of the ivory pomegranate with the temple is an inscription around the shoulder, as you can see in this picture. Part of the central ball of the pomegranate is damaged, making the inscription incomplete, but the letters that survived are quite clear. They are sufficient to work out what the whole inscription would have read, namely, belonging to the temple of Yahweh, holy to the priests. Yahweh, of course, is the name of Israel's God. Experts have dated the shape of the letters back to at least the 8th century BC. In 1997, this inscribed potsherd was found, referring to, quote, the house of Yahweh, which is a common designation in the Bible for the temple at Jerusalem. Being written in the old Hebrew script, that is Paleo-Hebrew, which was used before the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple and took the Jews into exile, it could only refer to Solomon's temple and has been dated between the 9th and 7th century BC. This is one side of a cylindrical seal used to stamp official, official documents, <clears throat> one of many found by the archaeologists, but this one is particularly interesting. On this side can be seen three Hebrew letters, Shin, Lamed, and Mem, spelling Shlomo, the Hebrew name for Solomon. In the Bible, Solomon is spelled with the final letter, H-E-H, though often in Hebrew, such vowelless letters are left off. The other side of the seal, seen here, depicts a royal figure bearing a scepter, wearing a skirt-like garment reminiscent of the ephod worn by Solomon's father, King David, as we read in 2 Samuel 6, verse 14. This seal has been dated back to the time of King Solomon and may have belonged to an official in his court. Both sides of the seal show a wing design indicating Phoenician or Egyptian influence. This would be consistent with the biblical record for it says Solomon married an Egyptian and Phoenician, among others, and even ended up patronising their gods. Okay, I want to come back to Herod's temple, an artist's impression of which you see here. John chapter 2 verse 20 says the building of it had been taking place for 46 years 
and uh, still wasn't finished in Jesus' day. And many references are made to Jesus and his apostles visiting it. References are also made to it by Josephus, confirming its existence. In spite of this indisputable evidence, some have claimed there never was a Jewish temple on this mount and that a fortress built by the Romans was there. However, neither Josephus or any uh, secular historian can be quoted to prove that. But having said that, both the Bible and Josephus do refer to a fortress on the northwest corner of Herod's temple, which Herod named Antonia. You can see uh, its position on this diagram. It was named Antonia after Mark Antony, the Roman ruler who had promoted Herod to power as ruler over the Jews. So the Temple Mount was not the fortress. The fortress was built outside the northwest corner of the Temple Mount and was built by Herod, not the Romans. In AD 70, the Romans toppled the upper courses of the temple enclosure wall around the mount, leaving stones lying around the base of the wall, as you see here, which have been lying there ever since they were toppled. Why would they do that if it was their own fortress? The stones have been lying there since AD 70, but finally got investigated by the archaeologists. And what they found clearly testified that the walls around this mount were the enclosure walls surrounding a Jewish temple, not a Roman fortress. This large stone had fallen from a pinnacle or parapet on the southwest corner and had an incomplete inscription on it. The inscription said, To the place of trumpeting. As this reconstruction shows, on the southwest corner of the Jewish temple enclosure wall was a special designated place for a priest to stand to blow the trumpet. He did this to announce the beginning and end of the Sabbath as well as other Jewish holy days and festivals. Josephus, the first century historian, actually describes the very spot as being, quote, above the roof of the priest's chambers. This seven-branch menorah was found among the rubble of Herod's temple. It was carved on the back of a sundial and confirmed again the Jewish connection to this mount. A lot of excavation has been done down around the southern area of the mount, as you can see here, and it is now an archaeological park through which visitors can walk. Along this area, the archaeologists have uncovered 48 ritual immersion bars like this one, known as a mikvah. <clears throat> These ritual immersion bars would have served thousands of pilgrims who came up to the temple from all over Israel and the world. No worshipper would walk up onto the temple mount without firstly going down into water. The Jews were very strict about purification. These immersion bars clearly testify to the mount being a Jewish temple mount, not a Roman fortress. During excavation, a fragment of a stone vessel was found bearing the inscription letters K-R-B-N, which means Corbin, and signified a sacrificial gift dedicated under oath. Here it is here. Two crudely drawn pigeons or doves appear upside down below the inscription. The vessel would have been used with a sacrifice on the temple mount. Mark chapter 7 verse 11 refers to Jesus speaking about Corbin and the misuse of it by the religious leaders of the day. Here's another inscription that unquestionably belonged to Israel's Temple Mount. It says, quote, No foreigner may pass the barrier and enclosure surrounding the temple. 
anyone caught doing so will be himself to blame for his resulting death. And this Greek inscription is interesting. It's a request for donations to help build Herod's temple, not a Roman fortress. Another Hebrew inscription found in 1969 was carved into one of the wall stones under this arch known as Robinson's Arch. The words are similar to Isaiah 66 verse 14 and expresses optimism that the Jewish temple would soon be rebuilt. It reads, quote, And when you see this, that is, the temple rebuilt, your heart shall rejoice. End of quote. Finding such an inscription on the wall that surrounds the mosques certainly indicates the Jewish temple used to be on the mount where the mosques are today. And Bible prophecy teaches that a Jewish temple will be built on this mount in the end time and will be one of the major signs of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many signs today to indicate that we are getting near to that time, but that's another subject for another time.